Well, today we continue in our chronological Bible. Um, hopefully you've been enjoying reading along in the chronological Bible. Uh, today we're going to look at starting in Exodus chapter 1. So if you have your Bible, you're welcome to turn there uh, with us this morning. Exodus chapter 1, we're going to be looking at the life of Moses for the next few minutes together. Now, uh, I talked with Craig uh, a little bit, kind of gave him a little bit of a hard time because he spent two weeks on the life of Joseph, which is about 14 chapters of the Bible, and he said, hey, I need you to cover Moses in one week, which is about 140 chapters. <laughs> So 10 times as many chapters, I gave him a little bit of a hard time, but, but I'm curious as, as we get started, um, how many of you have seen a movie on the life of Moses? We got a couple that'll come up on the screen. Maybe you've seen some of these movies. How many of you have seen The Ten Commandments? All right, all right. What about The Prince of Egypt? Okay, a few, a few less. What about the movie Exodus, Gods and Kings? which is mildly based on the story of, of Moses. It's a, it's a very uh, Hollywood version of the story of Moses. Now, uh, if you've seen, which many of you have, The Ten Commandments, you know that that movie took almost four hours to talk about the life of Moses. I promise I won't take that long. Uh, we're going to walk through this as quickly as we can. But whether you've seen it or not, um, we're, we're not going to be able to cover all of the life of Moses. But we are going to hone in as I was praying and just asking God to show me what part he'd have me to kind of focus in on. And he began to speak to me, uh, that, and I get to share with you today. Uh, I did want, uh, even though we're only going to focus on one part, uh, I did want to kind of walk through the life of Moses and put us all on the same page as to what's happening, what's going on. And I'm going to try to give you an overview of those four chapters, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which encompass the life of Moses. I'm going to try to do it in one minute, and then we'll continue on and focus on some of these other parts. First of all, we have God's chosen family, as Craig talked about uh, last week, uh, God's chosen family that had moved moved to Egypt. So the nation of Israel was beginning. These 70 people uh, from Jacob's family and the nation of Israel moved to Egypt. They begin to grow into a large nation. Pharaoh, there's a new king that comes in who doesn't have any ties to Joseph and decides to say, you know what, these people are foreigners and they're, they're growing. We got to do something. So let's make them our slaves. And so he makes them slaves. And for 400 years, they're in slavery in Egypt. God's people are in slavery in Egypt and it's oppressive and it's harsh slavery. And over this time, they've grown from 70 people, and about 400 years later, over 400 years later, they've grown to almost 2 million people. And that's what the nation of Israel is. And so the people begin to cry out to God, and we'll see why in just a moment, why they cry out in this moment. God raises up a deliverer named Moses. He prepares him in Egypt, prepares him in, a, in the wilderness. He calls him, he sends him, and says, you're going to bring my people into the land that I have promised them. Then they make a, a miraculous and dramatic exit from Egypt. God leads them, guides them, gives them the law, reveals himself to them. They make promises that they break over and over and over and over and over again. They wander in the wilderness for 40 years, complaining all the way. God does great miracles. He provides water. He provides food all the way through, and then they make it to the edge of the promised land, and that's where we're finishing off today. All right? So maybe just over a minute, but that's the overview of where we're going to be today. But I want to pause before we start unpacking the part uh, that we're going to focus on and just ask you, for many of you who uh, have been reading along, uh, and maybe some of you who've read it before, I wonder if maybe you feel a little bit the same way I did. As I read along, I sit there and look at these people, and I say, I can't believe they can do these things. I can't believe they can see all the things they've seen and experience God the way they've experienced Him and still continually turn their back on Him, make these promises and then turn their back on Him. And then I realize as I, as I spend more more, and more time in it. I'm like, this is my story. Anybody else find yourself in the story of these people, of God's people that you say, you know what, I can't believe they would do that. And then you look at your own life and you're like, yeah, I'd, I'd do that too. I find myself saying, God, I promise I'm going to trust you. And like two minutes later, I'm like, God, why is this happening? I don't, I don't get it. Why are you letting this happen? And immediately I begin to do that. I find myself saying, God, thank you that you've rescued me, that I'm no longer a slave to sin. And then I find myself going back, right? Just like they did, where they're constantly looking back and saying, you know what, maybe it was better in Egypt. Maybe we should go back, forgetting how harsh it was, forgetting uh, that they had cried out for deliverance, and now they're being delivered just in like the way it ha was happening. 
I find them, the story of God's people, I find myself in that story as well. So we're going to pick up in Exodus chapter 1, remembering that this is the story of us, just like it's the story of them. Exodus chapter 1, starting in verse 1. It says, these are the names of the son of, sons of Israel, that is Jacob, who moved to Egypt with their father, each with his family. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, uh, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. In all, Jacob had 70 descendants in Egypt, including Joseph, who was already there. In time, Joseph and all of his brothers died, ending that entire generation. But their descendants, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and filled the land. Eventually, a new king, or Pharaoh, came to power in Egypt, who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. He said to his people, look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from the country. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build the cities of Pithom and Ramses as supply centers for the king. The Pharaoh was so concerned that they were growing, was so concerned about the safety of that nation that they wouldn't get turned on. He said, we're going to make them into slaves. That was, he con that was what he was concerned about. It says, but the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, and the more alarmed the Egyptians became. So the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter, forcing them to mix mortar and make bricks and do all the work in the fields. They were ruthless in all their demands. And then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua. When you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. But because these midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live too. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said, why have you done this? Why have you allowed the boys to live? The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, the midwives replied. They are more vigorous and have their babies so quickly that we cannot get there in time. So God was good to the midwives, and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them fa families of their own. It says, then Pharaoh gave this order to all of his people, throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River, but you may let the girls live. He was getting so concerned that he began to say, you know what, what are we going to do about these people that keep expanding? And he came up with a solution and he said, we're going to wipe out an entire generation by killing off all the men. If we can stop, if we can kill off all the men, then the women become a part of our culture and they don't have their own culture anymore. He was so concerned and he said, kill them. The midwives wouldn't do it. So he said, all right, we're going to, he told all of Egypt now, not just the midwives to kill the boys. All of Egypt, if you find a Hebrew boy that is born, a newborn, a young boy, usually about two ages, uh, the age of two and below, he said, throw them in the Nile River so that they will drown and die and we can cut off this nation. That was what was going on, and this is what is believed to be the reason that the people of God cried out. Because this was worse than slavery. This was harsher that they were killing all the boys in the family. That was the goal of what Pharaoh was trying to do. And it says in chapter 2, about this time, as God's people are crying out, a man and woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. This is Moses. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. The baby's sister stood at a distance watching to see what would happen to him. So she, she has this baby boy, and she's trying to hide him, and as you know, newborn babies don't have, as many of you know, newborn babies don't have a really loud cry oftentimes, but as they get older and their lungs develop more, their cry gets louder and louder. So she's hiding him and hiding him, and eventually she gets to the point where she says, I'm not going to be able to hide him anymore. And so she puts him in a basket and puts him in the Nile River. So this is a Hebrew boy that is now in the Nile River. 
I want to point that out. He's now in the Nile River, but she put him in a basket and put him in the Nile River. The sister's watching to see what happens. And then what we see happens is that the daughter of Pharaoh comes down to the Nile River. She sees a basket. And she tells her maids to go get the basket. They get the basket. She opens it up and she finds a Hebrew boy crying. She finds Moses crying in the basket. And the Bible says that she had compassion on him. So Miriam, his sister, is watching what is happening, and she walks up to, to the queen, I mean, to the princess of Egypt, and she says, do you want me to find a Hebrew mother that can nurse him for you? And she says, yes, please go find one. And so Miriam knows exactly who she's going to go to. She goes and gets Moses' mom. Moses' mom comes, and, and uh, the daughter of Pharaoh says, I will pay you if you will take care of this child. And she says, let me think about it. Yes, I'll take it. <laughs> and so she takes care of her own son. God has provided all the way through. It's an amazing miracle. She's taking care of her own son, and she's getting paid by the daughter of the Pharaoh to take care of her own son. But eventually she has to bring him back. And so she brings him back, and now he becomes a prince in the land of Egypt. In the house of Pharaoh, he becomes a prince, which means that he would have had the greatest education probably in the world. He probably would have had some of the finest military training anywhere in the world, probably some of the finest leadership training as a prince of Egypt, prince training anywhere in the world. And this is what Moses gets to be a part of. And then we see what happens is it kind of skips, the Bible kind of skips uh, a long period of time in Moses' life. As he's growing up, as a prince of Egypt, it kind of skips most of what happens there. And it says years later he goes, and he goes to see his people, which means that he knew he was a Hebrew. All along the way he knew he was a Hebrew, but he goes to see his people, and he sees an Egyptian beating one of the Hebrew slaves and probably trying to kill him. And so he looks both ways, and he kills the Egyptian and buries him in the sand, and he thinks he's gotten away with it. Then later he goes in and sees two Hebrews fighting with each other, tries to break them up. He's like, what's wrong with you guys? And they say, oh, are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? And you can imagine his face just goes white. All the blood rushes out because he knows he's been found out. And it scared him. So Moses begins to run, and he flees, and he goes to this place called Midian. And he, is, he begins, there's, what happens is he begins to help out these, these female shepherds, and they're so appreciative, so they invite him into the house. He gets to marry one of the daughters of Jethro, and then he begins to watch the sheep of Jethro. So the prince of Egypt is now a shepherd in the middle of nowhere. Because of all these things that have happened, now the prince of Egypt, the one that God is raising up, is now a shepherd in the middle of nowhere. Here's what happens in chapter 3, and this is where we'll focus the rest of our time. As Moses encounters God, it says, One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There an angel of the Lord, appe the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it did not burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to him, to himself, why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. The Lord warned, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And when Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Now I want to point out real quick, he said, I am the, I am the God of your father, of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. This isn't just a list that God is giving of our heroes of the faith. This is God telling Moses, I'm the God of all of these guys who have failed too. I am the God of ordinary men that I have used to do extraordinary things. That's what he's telling Moses. And as we read these next couple of verses, I want to pause before we read these next couple of verses because I think some of us will find ourselves hearing these verses a little bit differently if we pause for a second. Because I wonder if some people here, maybe you find yourself in a little bit of a desert. You came in today and you feel, you feel like you're in a spiritual desert, you feel like you're in a personal desert, an emotional desert, a wilderness of some kind. Maybe you've made some choices that you feel like have put you in a wilderness. 
Decisions that you've made that you say, you know what, I feel like I'm just so distant, like I'm missing out on my purpose. Maybe it's decisions that other people have made that hurt you in the past. Maybe they're still hurting you today. Maybe you're just dealing with circumstances that you feel like are just beyond your control and you're having a hard time handling those circumstances. Maybe you feel broken. Maybe you are in a situation that just kind of seems unfair. If that's you, you feel like you're in a wilderness moment, I want you to listen to these verses a little bit differently. It says, then the Lord said to him, verse 7, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress, distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. He says, I have certainly seen. I have heard their cries. I am aware of their suffering and I am coming to deliver them. If you feel like you're in a wilderness, if you feel like you're like the, like the Hebrews, you're crying out, the nation of Israel crying out for deliverance, I want you to know that he hears you. He sees you. He's with you. He's aware of your suffering. And he says deliverance is coming. God sees you wherever you are. When maybe you feel like he's distant, God, are you even seeing what's going on? He says, I see him. He says, I see you. God, are you even listening? He says, I hear your cries. God, I don't feel like you're here. He says, I'm here. And your deliverance is coming. Verse 9 says, look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I've seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh, and you must lead my people out of Egypt. You can imagine as all this is going on, Moses is like, you know, God's telling Moses all these things. Hey, my people, I see them, I hear them, I'm with them, I'm coming to deliver them. And, and Moses is probably like, good, I was wondering. I was kind of thinking the same thing. I was like, hey, maybe, maybe you're not seeing them, maybe you're not hearing, maybe you don't know what's actually going on. And God says, yeah, I'm aware. And Moses is probably like, that's awesome. And he says, so I'm going to come deliver them. And Moses is like, that's great. And he says, and you're going to be the one to do it. And Moses is like, what? <laughs> Come again? And here's what happens. This is the call of Moses. This is the moment that Moses is encountering God. And God is calling Moses and saying, hey, I'm going to use you. And Moses gives five excuses that we're going to look at here for the next couple of minutes. He gives five excuses as to why God cannot use them. And I think we'll all see ourselves in some way in some of these excuses as well. Here's how he first responds. It says, verse 11, Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Pause for just a second. Who is he to appear before Pharaoh? Oh, only the prince of Egypt that grew up in Pharaoh's house, right? He says, who am I? And then he says this, who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? He says, God, you don't understand. I'm a nobody. The first excuse, I'm a nobody. You don't understand, God. You don't know who you're talking to. Here's how God responds. God answered, I will be with you, and this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. Now, Moses hadn't seen the movies like we had. <laughs> so he didn't know what was going to happen. He just made the excuse that I'm a nobody, but God says, I will be with you. Moses, you don't have to worry about you. All you have to worry about is that I am with you. Because if I'm with you, then your faith can rest in me, not in yourself. I'm not asking you to trust in yourself. I'm asking you to trust in me because I will be with you. It's the same for us. When we use that excuse, God says, you know what? I understand, but I'm with you. I'm going with you. Will you go with me and I will go with you if you'll follow me? Then Moses said this. He protested and said, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me what is his name, then what should I tell them? He says, I don't know your name. Moses is essentially saying, what kind of a God are you? What does your name mean? 
What am I going to tell them about you? I can tell them that the God of your ancestors sent me, but they're going to ask, what about him? What God sent you? And here's how God replied. God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. He says, I am. And in English, we have a tendency to get that confused because it doesn't seem to make sense. Who are you? I am. God just says, I am. It's a subject and a verb. All that's needed, we tend to think it's bad grammar, but that's all that's needed. He says, I am. And what he's saying when he says, I am, this is a clarification of what they've always known about him as Yahweh. He's saying, I am. I am the one who always was, who is, and who will always be unchanging. And he says, I am. And what he's saying in this is he's saying, I am everything you will ever need. If you're wondering what it is that you need or you're wondering how to get what you need, he says, I am. If you say, I need this, he says, that's me, I am. Everything you need, he says, I'm going to enter in to every need they have. Anything you need, he says, I am. I am what you need, completely holy, unchanging, forever and always, always have been, am right now, and always will be everything you'll need. And so when Moses has to go tell these people, he's saying, just go tell them, I am. So when you wonder who, he says, it's me, I am. You wonder how? I am. He's, that's what God's saying. I'm going to take care of everything. If you wonder, if you need deliverance, he says, I'm going to deliver. That's what God's saying. Deliverance comes from God. You need healing? I am. That's what God is saying over and over. This is the picture of what he's saying, that I am everything they will need. Anything your need demands, he says, I am. And years later, Jesus would take this on. A lot of people said that Jesus never claimed to be God. He actually took this phrase, this name, and he said, I am. And he made seven statements specifically, said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he made these I am statements, making a claim that he was God in the flesh. And people tried to kill him for it. That's how much they knew. This is the same picture, the same name that Jesus began to take on. And then what he says later is he says, you're going to go tell the people of Israel, you're going to tell the leaders of Israel that I am has sent you. And then he said, then you're going to go to Pharaoh and you're going to say, hey, I need you to let my people go so we can go worship together. And Pharaoh's not going to let you go. And then he says, I'm going to have to reach out my hand and strike Pharaoh. And eventually, after I strike him and the people of Egypt, he will let you go. And then he says all these other things and they're going to send you out with a lot of wealth and things like that when they go. But he says, tell them that I am sent you. And then chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Moses protested again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? The third excuse that many of us give still today. What if they don't believe me? You know, I can tell them about you and I'm not sure exactly how to tell them about you. I'm not sure what to say about who you are, but what if I say all the things and they still don't believe me? What if they still aren't buying it? What if they're still saying, you know what, I just don't believe it. Here's what the Lord says. The Lord asked him, what is that in your hand? Moses replied, it's a shepherd's staff. And God said, essentially, trust me to use what I've put in your hands. I've given you some things and you just need to trust me. And you put those things that are in your hands, those things that I've given you, those things that I've entrusted to you, you put those things into my hands and watch what I can do. And he takes that, he talks to him about taking that shepherd's staff. He says, throw it down, it becomes a snake. Then he has him put his hand into his cloak and it comes out and it's covered in a disease like leprosy and then he puts it back in and it's clean. He says, if they don't believe the snake, then if they don't believe that, then he says, take some water out of the Nile, pour it out and it'll become blood. And he gives them these signs, but God says, just trust me to use what's in your hands. Trust me, take steps of faith with what I've given you and they'll believe you. And then he says this, Moses pleaded with the Lord, O Lord, I am not very good with words, 
I have never been, and I'm not now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. He says, his next excuse, I'm not good at talking to people. I'm not good. The prince of Egypt is not good at talking to people. Now, I kind of feel like this is a little bit like what happens when you have kids and you tell them to do chores. They're like, oh, I can't right now. My, oh, my ankle hurts now. Like all of a sudden, these things come up, right? These excuses come up. This is what Moses keeps doing. And now he's saying, I don't have, I'm not good at talking to people. I think for a lot of us, when it comes to sharing our faith, this is probably the excuse we use more than, more than any other ones of just saying, God, I'm not sure what I'm going to say. I don't know what to say. What if I don't have all of the answers? What if they ask me something and I don't have the answers and I get tongue-tied and I'm like, uh, I don't, I don't know how to respond to that. Here's what God says. The Lord asked Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you in what to say. He says, I've made your mouth. I've told you to go. I'm going to give you the words. You don't have to worry about it. All you have to do is go in obedience, and I will give you the words. I will instruct you in what to say. And he says the same things to us. And then here's the fifth excuse. Moses pleaded again. He's given lots of different excuses. He's tried to say, God, you can't do this because of, because of me, because of this, because of this, because of this, over and over again. And now he says, Lord, please send anyone else. He says, someone else can do it better. God, I know you might be calling me, but I'm sure somebody else can do a better job than I can. Someone else can do a better. God, please just send somebody else. You don't understand. It says, the Lord became angry with Moses. You wonder why he became angry with Moses. It's because Moses kept talking about himself. Moses kept saying, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't trust me? What am I supposed to say? What about my mouth? What about using somebody else because I'm not good enough? Somebody else can do it better. And God says, you're missing it because from the very start, I told you it's not about you. It's about me. And I'll be with you and I will give you the words to say. That's my job. As you walk in obedience, that's my job. And he says, somebody else can do better. Then the Lord became angry with Moses, and he said, all right. Verse 16, Aaron will be your spokesman to the people. He will be your mouthpiece, and you will stand in the place of God for him, telling him what to say. Take your shepherd's staff with you and use it to perform the miraculous signs I have shown you. Here's what God says. God says, okay, I'm going to send somebody with you, but you're not off the hook. I'm not sending someone in your place because, Moses, I have called you. And here's what begins to happen as we see this all unfold. We see that this request of Moses to send somebody else and God saying, finally, I'll send somebody with you, but you're not off the hook. It became a snare to him over and over again. He's got his brother Aaron that's with him who's constantly causing problems for him, right? as they're wandering in the wilderness. He's on Mount Sinai, he gets the Ten Commandments, he comes down, and Aaron is leading the people in worship of a false god. He has to deal with his brother, and he gets to deal with the snare. And as, it, as we continue on through the book of Exodus and then Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we see that Moses kind of begins to speak for himself, because he's like, you know what, I probably made a mistake asking my brother to come. And he has to deal with the snare because he'd been given all these excuses, and every single time, God said, you're worried about you. All you need to know is I am with you. And if you know that I am with you and that I have called you and I am sending you, that's all that matters. He says, I'm with you. A few thoughts as, as we look at this for our personal call, what God would call us to, what God has called us, uh, called us to, and what God will call us to. A few thoughts. One of the things I, I was thinking as I was looking and studying this, I saw that, that God calls people when they're busy. You might say, what are, what are you talking about? Well, Moses was tending sheep. He was busy doing something. He wasn't just in the wilderness sitting down saying, oh, woe is me. Now he might have felt that way, but he was still doing something. You think about Gideon threshing wheat in the wine press. You think about Samuel serving in the tabernacle. David, who was also out in a pasture as well. Elisha was plowing. The disciples were running their fishing business, some of them. Matthew was collecting taxes, actually doing something. They're called when they're busy, that God calls people when they're busy. And I want to just say that because 
I wonder if some people here feel like you've been put out to pasture. You might feel like what you're doing is meaningless. Maybe you've heard that phrase, maybe you understand that phrase, but think of, think of a racehorse who's majestic and beautiful and has this real specific purpose and then people finally say, you know what, we're done with this one, we're gonna put it out to pasture, basically to just live the rest of its life until it dies. It doesn't have the purpose we've created it for anymore, so we're gonna put it out to pasture to just live until it dies, that's all it is. And I kinda wonder if Moses maybe felt this way in some ways, but let me ask you a question. Why do you think God would raise up this deliverer with all the education as a prince of Egypt, with all the formal training, probably military training, leadership training, prince training, all this kind of stuff, and then why would he put him out to pasture like this? Why would this be a part of his story for 40 years of his life that he's a shepherd in the wilderness? Why would that be the case? I think Moses' pasture was God's preparation. Because what did he spend the next 40 years doing? Leading God's people, stubborn, complaining, difficult people through the exact same wilderness area that he was leading sheep. He had to lead them in the exact same place. Moses knew how, what it was like to live in the city, but he didn't know how to lead people through a wilderness. So God took him to the wilderness to pasture, to teach him and to prepare him for what he had. His pasture was God's preparation. I kind of wonder if some people here might feel like you've been put out to pasture. Like maybe you've lost a job recently, or maybe you were early retired, or maybe you retired and you feel like your purpose may be kind of over and you're just kind of living out the rest of your life, but you feel like the greatest years are behind you. More, Moses was between the age of 40 and 80 when he was doing this, when he was a shepherd. That was his age. If any of you fit into that category and in some way you feel like your best days are behind you, I wanna tell you, God has not put you out to pasture. He's still preparing you. He still has a calling for you. There's still something for you. You're not put out to pasture. Maybe what you feel like is being put out to pasture is God's preparation in your life. And what we need to do is just continue to be faithful in the field that he's put us in. Because when we're faithful in the field, we'll get to see him work. And Moses was just herding sheep, just shepherding sheep. I want to close by asking a question. How did the deliverance of God's people begin in the book of Exodus? began with a baby being born. God saw a need of people needing deliverance. A baby was born. Pharaoh's daughter calls the basket, asks the basket to be brought over. Here's the cry of a baby. But it wasn't just any baby. Moses was brought into this land to rescue his own people from the bondage of slavery to the Egyptian people. And he was rescued for a purpose, to bring God's people out of Egypt, and then God was gonna take Egypt out of the people. He was gonna bring them out to set them apart, to create a new nation. And it wasn't, he, God wasn't creating a nation and separating a nation and setting them apart so that he could bless them and abandon all the other nations. Because I think I've even felt that way sometimes of, God, why just these people? And why does it feel like you're abandoning all the other nations? What he was doing was he was setting them apart to create a testimony of himself. Because when he created a testimony of himself, everybody in the world at that time began to see these people and say, there's something unique about those people. Their God is different than all the other gods. The God of the Egyptians, the gods of the Egyptians was not the same as their God. And everybody knew it when he separated them. Now he was not separating them to abandon the other people. He was putting a testimony in them for the sake of the other people. And we see that in the promise to Abraham. He says, all the nations of the world will be blessed through you, but it had to happen by setting a nation apart 
so that everybody would look and say there's something different about them. So they became a blessing, they became a testimony to other people and for the sake of other people in the world. I asked you how the deliverance of these people began. I want you to ask you a question. How did our deliverance happen? It began with a baby that was born and brought into this world to rescue you and me from the slavery of sin, from being slaves to sin so that we could be set apart as his special people, so that we could be the light of, of the world, so that we could be his light set apart to display his glory to all of the world, not just to the world, but for the world. Their story is our story from beginning to end. It is all the same. And this story is a story in history. It's not just a type of story to tell another story. It's God telling his story all along, all the way through scripture. It began the same way. We are rescued from our slavery to sin so that we can be a light, so that we can display his glory to the world, so that we can display his glory for the world. So what if we walked in that same understanding? We look at these people, we say, how can you be set apart? How can you get to see all these things happen and miss out on what God is doing? How can you miss it? And we miss it sometimes too. Let's live for his glory. Let's display his glory to the world and let's display his glory for the world with no excuses.